evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Women Making History in Central Florida event, hosted by your commissioner, Emily Bonilla. And tonight, she is our MC and the host of this event. I'm going to now give the mic to Commissioner Emily Bonilla. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for sharing your time with us tonight to learn a little more about the women who are making history in Central Florida. I'm Emily Bonia. It's my pleasure to be here as your moderator and my privilege to serve as the first female county commissioner in District 5. We are here today to honor all the women who have made history one way or another. We want to keep their legacies alive and inspire each and every one of you and everyone watching. As women, we have an obligation to do our part to foster a world that encourages and respects our young ladies. Women have not had it easy. Throughout my life, I can recall the stories of countless times someone said, that's not for girls. Women can't do everything men can do. Today, we are standing tall and proud of how far we have come. We now have women in every position possible, from truck drivers, executive CEOs, politicians, and so much more. Briefly, I want to share a little bit about my background. I grew up in poverty, and I struggled most of my life. I grew up only hearing you can be a teacher, lawyer, or a doctor to escape poverty. I started my journey moving towards med school. However, I was not passionate about it. I ended up changing my major to film and writing. And since then, I obtained my bachelor's in English literature. I'm a mother, wife, entrepreneur, and a strong advocate for the people. Today, I hope to inspire you to take a leap of faith and make a difference in your community. Despite the adversities I've faced in life, I'm the first female commissioner of District 5, and I am honored to be joined by an amazing woman making a difference every day. Behind every successful woman is a tribe of other successful women who have her back. We would not be here today without the involvement and influence of this wonderful panel of women. It gives me great pride to be permitted to introduce women like Joy Wallace Dickinson, who is a celebrated historian, but who is also making history in her own right. Joy is a writer for the Orlando Sentinel and author of three books, including Orlando City of Dreams. She's a well-respected teacher of Central Florida History and Rollins College Lifelong Learning Program. She will speak about women who made history in Central Florida. Another one of, another of our women making history is N.Y. Nathiri, whose writings are well known around the world. Ms. Nathiri has been quoted by prestigious news publications such as the New York Times and Anna Lemma Magazine. She is the celebrated author of Zora Neale Hurston, a woman and her community, and responsible for making the facts of Zora Neale Hurston's community work known again. Mrs. Nathuri has broadened all our horizons with her work. Lastly, it is my pleasure to celebrate the much vaunted work of Mrs. Betsy Francis Cheney, whose long history or, or advocacy for the Latino people in the state of Florida has earned her awards that are too numerous to mention here. Mrs. Francis Cheney is currently the Senior Director of Florida and Southeast Programs and Policy for the Hispanic Federation. Orange County, and in fact, all of us owe these amazing history-making women a debt of gratitude for their hard work and unselfish dedication to their community. Thank you again for your attendance, and I hope you'll join me in the appreciation of these speakers and of all women making history in Orange County. Let's give them a round of applause. And we're going to start with Joy Dickinson. As an Orlando native, Wallace has an was an editor of the Institute of Early American History in Williamsburg, Virginia. Since 2000, she has written hundreds of Florida flashback features in the Orlando Sentinel about aspects of Central Florida's past. She's also the author of three books, including Orlando City of Dreams, and teaches classes about Central Florida and Rollins College Lifelong Learning Program. Well, I, I'm... So happy to be here, and thank you for the invitation, Commissioner. And I'm especially excited, uh, not only as Commissioner Bonilla, the first female commissioner from District 5, but all the Orange County commissioners now are women. 
which is quite remarkable. And um, so I have looked back especially uh, because one of, one of the main things that I do in the column I write is just remind people, I think, that Florida has a history, Central Florida has a fascinating history, and I take no greater um, enjoyment than reminding people or in exploring myself the women who have made history in Central Florida. And I'm thinking especially in light of um, these uh, path-breaking women on the, the commission, um, back about 100 years, there's a picture in the archives of this institution um, that actually is appearing in a book that my friend Ann Patton has written, who's, who's sitting here. That's a history of the League of Women Voters, 80 years old this year in, in Orange County. And in this picture, uh, which is before the League of Women Voters, it is right out on Central Boulevard that many of you crossed as you got here. It's about 1913. And there's a car, a couple of cars in a parade and the car is full of women, and on the side of the car is a banner that says equal suffrage, because those women could not vote. Um, and uh, they had worked hard and were continuing to work hard for a long time to get the right to vote. Now, Orlando should really, and Orange County should really be proud of the fact that the Florida Equal Suffrage Association was based here, was founded here by a, uh, a remarkable woman who had retired here, was a Unitarian minister named Mary Safford. And knowing that uh, in, in a rare, um, rare moment of appreciation for this progressive association, the Sentinel, in 1916 wrote an editorial saying how great it was that Orlando was the home of the Florida Equal Suffrage Association because um, the advertising advantage the city has attained from being the headquarters of the association is not to be lightly valued. So as always, um, we could see the commercial value in things, and at the end it said, Orlando was proud of this distinction and proud of the able and a dignified woman, Reverend Mary Safford, who presides over the meetings today and tomorrow, whose personality is a living refutation of the charge not infrequently made that the equal suffrage movement is led by women without womanly charm. So you can sort of, that gives you a little hint of sort of the attitudes of the time that, that uh, the women who were fighting for the vote had to uh, had to counter. So if you look at women in the past, I find, and you, it's awfully easy, anybody in the past, but I'm thinking of women, it's easy to look at these pictures of, of women and assume their lives were, were like yours. But as I said, if you, uh, if you were um, most places in the country and a woman before August 18th, 1920, uh, you could not, your right to vote was not guaranteed. Uh, Florida, by the way, was among the very last states to add its approval to the 19th Amendment. Didn't do it until May 1969, almost 50 years after the amendment passed in Congress in 1919. But as I said, some uh, Orange County women were in the vanguard. Uh, in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party was the first national party to support women's suffrage. And uh, that very year, um, or Orlando's unflappable city clerk, Cassius Boone, nearly fell out of his chair when a group of women marched into his office and demanded the right to vote in a bond election. He said, no way, but as we said, they didn't give up. Uh, they formed the Equal Suffrage League of Orlando and then the Florida Equal Suffrage League, led by Mary Safford. At and uh, she went to, um, she spoke during a public hearing in Tallahassee on a proposed state constitutional amendment to give women the vote. And at first it looked like it didn't have a chance, uh, but it did, it did at least get out of the committee, but not by the, not by the necessary vote needed. So even women being able to vote then was considered quite controversial. Um, according to an essay in the Sentinel, one of the arguments was if you make women equal, 
Uh, if you make women equal to, to vote, then they have to be equal to in all respects. Oh my goodness, they might even have to be in the army. Wasn't that an amazing idea? Um, and uh, it was not unusual to see uh, humorous essays suggesting that um, the women's brigade in the army might dissolve into chaos when two of its leaders uh, got into a fight about feathers in their hats. So, I mean, it, these women had to put up with a lot of ridicule, and um, which I remember even uh, Commissioner Bonillo made some references, but I remember uh, one of my first memories from my first working experience was, uh, it was in an academic institution, I was told that all the girls in my workplace were expected to take turns making coffee. And one of the most revolutionary things I ever did was circulate a memo suggesting that everybody take turns making coffee. <laughs> And uh, there were some people who wouldn't speak to me for a while. That was considered so, so revolutionary. Well, uh, women in uh, Orange County, Winter Park in Orlando, did actually vote. They kept it up and they did vote in a bond election 100 years ago this May in 1919 before the, before the passage of the 19th Amendment. They kept it up and were given the the opportunity to vote. I think the, the, the issue had to do with paving streets and beautification. So uh, that's another thing to, you know, to be grateful. So I, I think I just, what I'd like to say mostly is appreciation to all these women who came before us, uh, who worked very hard, particular so, particularly so that we uh, might have the vote and and not only have the vote but run for office and and uh, help lead our society and it, it's it's been a long time coming and many more gains to be had but uh, much much sacrifice in the past and achievement to be proud of thank you, thank you joy Next, we have N.Y. Nathiri. She's an executive director of the Association to Preserve the Eatonville Community, Inc., PEC. She has worked in the field of historic preservation for almost 30 years. During that time, having spent on behalf of her hometown, Eatonville, Florida, which is popularity, pop, popularly, no, sorry, <laughs> known as the oldest incorporated African-American community in the United States. She has also led the levels of government as well from national foundations such as the Andy Warhol Foundation. She currently serves as the Vice President for the Cultural Heritage Tourism on the Board of Directors for the Historic Black Towns and Settlements Alliance. I was born in a Negro town. I do not mean by that the black backside of an average town. Eatonville, Florida is, and was at the time of my birth, a pure Negro town. Charter, mayor, council, town marshal, and all. It was not the first Negro community in America, but it was the first to be incorporated, the first attempt at organized self-government on the part of Negroes in America. Uh, thus wrote Zora Neale Hurston in the 1942 autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road. And uh, though she was not born in Eatonville, we know that she was actually born in Not Notasolga, Alabama. Uh, like her, I am from Eatonville, and I too was not born there. Uh, my mother traveled to the uh, naval um, a base in Sanford, uh, where she tells me that she, you could hear her screams down seven floors. Uh, but uh, I came uh, very soon back to uh, Eatonville. Um, it is interesting to uh, have Joy Dickinson talk about the role of women in the early 1900s. And so if you take that lens or that layer and apply 
what Zora Neale Hurston really represents as a woman who was a maverick, as a woman who would not, um, she, she was absolutely committed to education, to getting an education. Uh, she was in her late 20s when she became the first known graduate of Barnard College. Um, she was a woman who was married to her work. She had three marriages, but she was married to her work. Um, folklorist, the American folklorist, recognized Zora Neale Hurston as one of the premier folklorists because of her primary resource work. And it is because of Zora Neale Hurston that we have the authentic um, folk ways of people of African ancestry who lived in the rural South. But to understand and appreciate that this woman who has come from a little village and when she talks about her native village, that is because in the time of Zora Neale Hurston, there might have been about 100 people in Eatonville. And that she would commit to doing primary research, that is sitting and listening and documenting the stories on Joe Clark's uh, store, that she recognized that there was a beauty and a dignity about what she was hearing, and that she would have the unmitigated gall to write the dialect of those people, understanding that at this time in America's history, dialect, black dialect, was a way of verifying or confirming that those who spoke it were less than mm -hmm. standard English. To really have the chutzpah to do that um, showed a kind of, a kind of intellectual um, bravery. She is acknowledged now for her classic work, Their Eyes Are Watching God, where she really used that language, that dialect, and turned it into lyrical uh, English literature. Now, having said all of that, um, at, in 2019, we can appreciate Zora Neale Hurston as a global icon. But in 1987, before one man, one vote decision by the Supreme Court, Orange County determined that it was going to five lane, the two lane road that runs through the town of Eatonville. It is not an exaggeration to say that in 1987, the decision makers of Orange County had no idea of who Zora Neale Hurston was. That is not an exaggeration. They just did not know. And in fact, as we in Eatonville made, attempted to make the case that it would really be inappropriate to try to five lane the town of Eatonville. Frankly, the people, the decision makers of Orange County had no idea that Eatonville represented any historic significance. It was a community, as then Chairman Tom Dorman said, who had to give way so that others could progress, and perhaps later in history, the people in Eatonville would understand that their sacrifice was necessary. So in that context, to try to make the case that Eatonville was historically significant, that Zora Neale Hurston was um, the, pre, the, prim, the primary female voice of the Harlem Renaissance, to try to make that case really seemed as if we were, as the historic preservationists always are known, a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, I can say that now with humor, but in 1987 it was very frightening to go up against Orange County government uh, because it was the government. And yet we recognize that if we did not do that, Eatonville would fade away because that's what that is what happens when development comes to your community.
because when development comes to your community, you cannot afford to stay in your community because the property taxes are too expensive. That's just the way it is. So we talked amongst ourselves and understanding now that um, in Eatonville, the road was known as East Kennedy Boulevard. In Maitland, it was known as Lake Avenue. And in fact, there really was a coalition from the very beginning because the people in Maitland did not want their community uh, destroyed. Um, and we saw that if we could work together and make that case that we could be successful, if we could keep the county from turning dirt for five years. Okay. So the question came, all right, so you all think that you have an important community and you all think this, but really, how can you make that case to the public? Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities. That's exactly how. Most of us were school teacher types or in my instance, a librarian type. Uh, and so we needed to be careful not to be nerdy, not you know, lecturing to people. So it's a festival. We'll, we'll, we'll have fun as we try to inform the public about who Zora Neale Hurston is and why Eatonville is successful as a community and should be treasured. And so we started off with three goals, to celebrate the life and work of Zora Neale Hurston, the writer, the author, the anthropologist, to celebrate the historic significance of her hometown, which she had made known around the world as a literary destination, because when you read Zora Neale Hurston, inevitably, she is talking about Eatonville. We say that it's two sides of the same hand, Zora Neale Hurston here, Eatonville there. And then the third, to celebrate the cultural contributions which people of African ancestry have made to the United States and to world culture. All right, so that, that's what we were going to do. In 1990, Eatonville's population was about 2,200 people. At the first festival, we had 10,000 people coming from around the country. Actually, that's not hyperbole. We actually could count those people because of the different uh, programs that we had. It was really uh, quite astonishing. The Orlando Sentinel came to us and said, um, NY, do you think black people could afford to pay $29 for a book? I said, well, it depends on the book. <laughs> and they said, but they came, that's light humor to say, they came because they saw a commercial opportunity because we really had made the case. I mean, who knew that, in Eat that Eatonville, Florida, would attract this kind of, this kind of um, audience. This before now, ecotourism, cultural tourism, heritage tourism, those were not parts of the lexicon. So this business of the niche market, that people would actually want to come and discuss and enjoy um, arts and culture and history and heritage, that was really, that was something uh, quite uh, different. So 30 years later, we have just completed the, uh, our 30th annual Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities, and we have become a textbook uh, template for cultural heritage tourism. Um, we are an award-winning, nationally recognized um, event for authentic presentation of cultural heritage by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, we were included as a, a model for small, challenged, economically challenged communities, because as we sit here, Eatonville is still known as a low socioeconomic community. That really is the, that is the reality. But the richness of the culture and heritage draws people from literally all over the world. And so as I close my remarks, I want to acknowledge the University of Central Florida, which hosted the 13th Biennial Collegium for African American Research called CAR, that's a group of scholars from Europe who were joined by the World Conference of Mayors with mayors from West Africa and from South America and the Caribbean, and by the Historic Black Towns and Settlements Alliance with people from Texas and Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. In other words, this kind of global assemblage around culture and heritage, which makes an economic impact and which 
thank you very much, drove about 700 room nights of heritage tourism visitors. Thank you. Last but not least, Betsy Franceschini. Since her arrival, arrival to Florida in 1985, her 30 plus years of effort have been focused on serving the community in the areas of cultural awareness, civic engagement, Hispanic community empowerment, advocating on issues to increase the quality of life of Latinos in the state and nationally. She is currently the Senior Director of Florida and Southeast Programs and Policy for Hispanic Federation. She previously held the position of Florida Director for the Office of Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration, representing the government of Puerto Rico and the million Puerto Ricans residing in the state. She was elected as one of the top national Latino leaders to meet with President Obama to discuss Hispanic issues. She has received multiple awards and recognitions since 1999, among others. Uh, Commissioner, I really appreciate uh, you hosting this uh, magnificent event. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge all of the leader, women leaders that are in this room today, uh, that all of you, I know, are doing a great job in your respective roles to make this a strong community. And I know many of you, and I congratulate you also. Uh, I come from a humble beginning, uh, from a working family. Uh, I want to dedicate today's um, event to my father, who's 91 years old today. Today is, is his birthday. He is um, you know, struggling. His health is not doing very well. But he was my inspiration, him and my mother. Uh, he taught me the passion and the commitment for and the love for community service. Uh, my father was a, a union uh, leader with the United States Steel in, in Chicago and always talked to us about making sure that we got involved in, in defending people's rights because those, as, as uh, Joy mentioned, you know, we, we, we sometimes take it for granted, but we have not always had these rights. And uh, when I came here in uh, 1985, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I grew up in Chicago and then uh, part of my life also on the island. Uh, but I came in, in 1985 and there was barely anybody that spoke Spanish. I actually was um, faced by a lot of uh, rejection and discrimination uh, because of the color of my skin, because I spoke Spanish. And, you know, those are things that made me even think, okay, we have to do something to defend our rights, to make sure people know who we are. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of information, misinformation about our people, that we were coming, that we, you know, just like we, we hear today, right, in, in many aspects. Uh, but, you know, the important thing is to make sure that you connect. I, I became a member of the Puerto Rican Association of Central Florida. Uh, became president there and started engaging in the community, helping entrepreneurs develop their own business, making sure that people understood you know, the political process and the importance of getting involved, registering to vote and voting. Uh, I have to say that you know I have a lot of people here that were walked with me uh, in making sure that that message got out, that we engage our people, that we empower our people. I've had the honor of an opportunity to uh, be part of organizations and agencies like the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration, also Hispanic Federation, uh, where we were able to connect with different organizations and people. And in the community and develop programs to help uh, improve the quality of our, our people in the community. So it is important. I think, you know, the, the, the key is do not stop. You know, keep going, inspire, identify what it is you, you love and do it. Serve others with that that you love. Uh, because we all have something to offer. And as women, we have come a long way, as, as many of you have know and have read. You know, we have to do take extra steps. Uh, you have to demonstrate even stronger because you're a woman. But I think we are, in, right now in 2019, we are showing that we have 
genuine talents and power to do what we need to do to make this a better world, a better community. Uh, we have experienced people, like the ones sitting here, that could help us along the way and along the journey. Uh, but don't give up. I think as women, we need to stand up as Latinas, you know, and, and other, you know, uh, minority groups. We have to struggle even more, but we need to make sure that we make a difference in everything we do. Do it with pride. Uh, we as women have unique gifts of logic, decisiveness, strength, combined with intuition and emotional conviction. That, as women, we bring uh, to the table. Learning to balance and tap into these gifts as we face challenges, decisions, and opportunities will definitely help us guide our path through our journey of life and be successful. And I want to close uh, with a quote um, from Oprah Winfrey. I've come to believe that each has a personal calling that as unique as our fingerprint and that the best way to succeed is to discover what you love and then find a way to offer it to others in the form of service. Working hard and always allowing the energy of the universe to lead you. Woman, this is our time. We must make a difference and I know we could all together do it as, and to be a better community. Thank you. Thank you for your wisdom and your words and for all the inspiration that you're spreading out today. I mean, that's what we're here for and you have not come short. So thank you so much. Um, before we go to Q&A, I would like to recognize our elected officials. We have Daisy Morales from Soil and Water. <laughs> and we have Vivian Rodriguez representing Congressman Darren Soto. And at this moment, I'd like to open it up to Q&A, and I have my aide, Jeanette Martinez, here with the microphone to go around. And so anyone who wants to ask any questions, you can just raise your hand, and she'll come to you. No questions? There, we got one. OK, got a couple. Well, it's really not a question. I just want to acknowledge that everyone that's sitting there, we are very proud of all the work that you've done as women especially for Betsy Francesini, who I know personally, who's a dear friend. Um, congratulations. And um, I just want to acknowledge, you know, all women leaders, all the work that you do, especially Commissioner, for bringing this event. I'm very proud of all the work that women are doing. And as they say, this is the year of the woman, so continue doing the great work. Thank you. Um, first off, I want to just thank all of you women. You guys are just awesome. Um, each one of you guys inspire me um, as a woman, and um, I'm not as of age that I can experience uh, some of those things about women not being able to vote. But um, I, I honor the women who have passed on and who have made a way for the women voices to be heard because women have always been behind the line for years. Um, so. Um, NY, I just, I just want to tell you, you really inspire me. Um, speaking about um, Eatonville, um, I read a lot of uh, Zero Neale Hurston books, and um, what she had experienced, I don't think nobody could even imagine what she experienced, but the pain and suffering and the joy she had, she wrote it on a piece of paper. She wrote it in her books. And again, everything you read about her books is about Eatonville, about the, the, um, the people that are from Eatonville. So, I just want to thank you for keeping that alive. And also, I have been attending the Eatonville festivals for um, the past eight years. Um, it's phenomenal. If you guys haven't even experienced, that's the best place to even get that type of history, um, the little bit that she has spoke of tonight. So again, hats off to each and every one of you ladies there, because your voices mean a lot to the community. And I think all the women here are leaders, as well as myself, because I'm work, I work in my community as well. But um, I just thank you guys. Just listen to that. I'm going through some transitions in my life. And just listening to you guys helped me see things a lot clearer in my community. And it, it's driven me to even work even harder in my community. So thank you.
Thank you. So I just want to know, how do you get involved as a Hispanic woman here in Orlando? I had a lot of needs. I came here, I didn't know anybody, I didn't know how to connect, I didn't know how to get resources, you know, help my family. And I just struggled, uh, you know, asking, and, and I said, you know what, and I've heard a lot of friends talk about the same thing and people come up and say, you know, I have these needs. So I said, I have to do something to, to give back. Uh, to those that helped me during that process. And because uh, if it wasn't for those families, people that you know were able to provide information and help me, I, I would have been lost. So I started connecting with uh, you know, local organizations, as I mentioned, the Puerto Rican Association of Central Florida, and started working there. I, I got involved in the cultural committee because I wanted to make sure that people knew about our culture, that it wasn't all you know, the negative that was coming out. Uh, and also uh, got involved with the Civic Engagement Committee because uh, I knew that there was a, a tremendous need. We were growing in numbers here in, in the his, in, as, as Hispanics in Central Florida, and they were not connected with you know, what was going on in the political arena, who were the candidates, and what they could bring to the table, what they could offer. Uh, so I started inviting a lot of these uh, candidates so they could speak with our community and, and understand what our needs were. Uh, so I got very active in that, and then I got, you know, in, involved in, you know, on the political side, uh, also uh, with organization with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and started advocating. There were, at that time, there was a lot a lot of uh, problems with, you know, police stopping, you know, a lot of Latinos and they didn't know how to speak the language and there was a lot of miscommunication and there were issues and we brought together, we organized uh, the, the, the leaders that were at the time and started writing letters, you know, we need more of uh, uh, policemen to to work in the uh, police force so that speak Spanish and understand our culture. We did the same thing with uh, teachers. There weren't that many uh, uh, his Spanish speaking teachers or bilingual teachers and there were our children were struggling. They didn't understand them. They thought maybe they were, you know, their IQ was low and it was basically that they didn't understand you know, the language, the culture. Uh, so we advocated. We, you know, got involved and with different leaders. And from there, I just kept navigating, bringing more people in, um, more organizations, and started, you know, making sure that, that our needs were met. Uh, and and, and the, the important thing is to make sure that we, we knock on doors. Don't wait for, for people to come to you and say, come on, get involved. There are many great organizations. There's the League of Women Voters who also provide excellent information and workshops and seminars on a monthly basis. You know, get involved because the important thing is that we, we all have something to offer and there is a tremendous need. Our growing community is, you know, has a lot of, uh, lacks a lot of information sometimes, and there are great resources out there. Uh, so I just started navigating, tapping in, and just being active and speaking up and trying to, to make a difference. And that opened, you know, great opportunities uh, where I was able to use that platform uh, to speak in behalf of our people, to advocate, to bring other leaders and, and organizations and work together and, you know, make an impact. Uh, so, you know, it could be done. It's never too late. Uh, and thank you for the question. Thank you. Yes, and, and we do have advisory boards at the county, which is a great opportunity to get involved. And we definitely need more women and we need more Hispanics. We have almost 30% of Hispanics in Orange County, but only about 16% of our advisory boards has Hispanic members in it. So we really need some more involvement in our advisory board. So it's a great opportunity to get involved. Sounds good. Thank you. So, Commissioner? You may or may not want to do this, but I'm fairly new to Orlando. I'd love to hear your story. Yeah. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So I was born in New York, raised in Massachusetts, and I was born to a, a mom who was 16 years old, and we, we had generational poverty. That's what I grew up in. Um, it wasn't a safe um, household or 
a safe place for a child to grow up in. And, you know, it was, it was really tough growing up. Um, and so we moved to Massachusetts. Um, basically, you know, it was me, it was me and four other kids. But before I had gone out of that household, I had two younger brothers who I was helping to raise. Um, the next youngest one was five years younger than me, and the other one was two years younger than that brother. And so I would, you know, try to, I would get some food stamps, what, you know, we called food stamps back then, go to the corner store, get some food. Um, I would try to gather cans in a neighborhood with some friends, and we'd go and get some change from turning and recycling the cans. And so that was how I grew up as a kid, um, hustling and <laughs> struggling just to get food in my stomach and my taking care of my brothers. Um, and there was a lot of children's services that was very helpful that my friends told me about. So we would go to the YWCA, which we had back then, um, Boys and Girls Club. Through the school, we had the Big Brother, Big Sister. Um, I had a lot of teachers who were very supportive of me, and they were great. Um, when they say teachers is a great inspiration to kids, I mean, they really are. They helped me through through school, making sure that, because they saw that I was very studious, and I loved to read, and I had a future, and so they encouraged me. I had my... We didn't really have a middle school, but um, in my seventh and eighth grade classes, my teachers were preparing me for high school and made sure that I chose the right classes in order to prepare for college. And they got me into the right classes. Um, sophomore year of high school, I met my husband. <laughs> so I, I married to my, my high school sweetheart. And I realized then too how important the teacher's guidance were to me because my husband didn't have that, and he ended up getting stuck into the classes that were the lower level classes. And I convinced him to change his classes to the higher level, and his grades started dropping, so his parents were really mad at me. <laughs> they started blaming me for it. But I was like, just wait, you know, he, these are the classes he needs to prepare for college. So, but to back up, I did, um, about the age of nine, I did move out from living with my mother to living with my grandparents. My grandfather was a, a big inspiration to my life as well. He made sure that I could believe in myself and he told me I could do whatever I wanted in life. And he really inspired me and pushed me. And you know, he, was a, he, was a, he had such a good heart, he was a good man. Um, but there was a lot of trouble in my family. Again, like living with my grandparents too. Um, he was an alcoholic, um, he was abusive, not to me. Um, so the story that they tell me is when I was born, my mother came home with me and had this baby, and he was drunk, he was like, let me see that baby. And this, I'm repeating the story that they tell me. Um, Bring that baby over here, let me see that baby. And my mother says that she was so scared that he was gonna drop me, and she put me in his arms, and he looked down and they said it was like love at first sight. <laughs> So that's the story they tell me, and they tell, and I think I remember this too. Um, I used to lay in his. He had this big round belly, and I used to lay in his belly while he watched Star Trek. So I'm a Trekkie, <laughs> right from birth. <laughs> so I used to watch Star Trek and Star Wars and all those sci-fi movies, and he did watch westerns too. And I found them really boring, though. <laughs> But um, so he was very inspirational to me. And as an adult going to college, my grandmother, though, wanted me to become a doctor. And I fainted the side of blood. So I was starting med school, but it really wasn't something I could do. I, I probably would have really failed at it. I mean, just imagine doing surgery and fainting every time you do surgery. Probably wouldn't have worked out. So um, my passion, though, was film and writing. And so I went into film school at Valencia Community College. Um, I was actually pregnant with my first child at that time, too, so I was going through film school pregnant, and everyone was so supportive there. And then I went to UCF for my bachelor's in writing, and then I went, I had a business that I ran for 10 years doing weddings. We started off with um, wedding videography, and then I expanded it to photography and DJ and planning. And I'm proud to say at that time it was the biggest, best wedding business in Central Florida. And I decided to close it, though, because it was during Saturdays, which I wanted to have a second child. And my first child was getting older to the point he wanted to do sports. 
So I couldn't really run that business and, you know, be there for my family and get them involved. So I closed that business, had my second child, went back to school for my master's, did business consulting, worked at Full Sail University. That's where I got my master's as well. And then we moved into six acres in East Orange County, and that's where my political involvement started. So we had a big development wanting to come in, 4,000 homes and 4,000 acres, and I said, no way, the city isn't going to keep following me, because you know I was born in New York and <laughs> raised in the city most of my life, and I wanted to raise my family on a farm. We called it our family. <laughs> and so I went to a community meeting. There was about 300 people there. I worked with the, the other neighbors, and I said, we should start a movement, we should call it Save East Orlando, and that movement was started. We gained 10,000 petition signatures, but our commissioner wasn't listening to us, and when elections started coming up, I was, as a, this is what women do, we just wait by the sidelines. I was waiting for someone else to run who I could support. The two men who decided to run was also in support of this development, so I said, well, if no one else is going to do it, I'll do it. So I decided to jump in, and I ran my race against three other men, and I won. No one thought I could win, and I did. Um, it was a district I wasn't supposed to win in, and here I am, the first female of District 5, and a Hispanic at that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so here I am today. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Like this one. Sir, would you mind standing so they can take a better picture? Oh, yeah, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your stories. Thank you for your leadership, your inspiration. Um, you've overcome so much. Women have come so far. My question is, looking from today forward, I wanted to ask each of you, looking through your, the lens of your own expertise, what challenges do you face today? What are the biggest uh, items on your radar that you see ahead that need to be tackled in terms of women's issues and rights and so forth? Okay, that's a great question. And I'll start with a little bit and then we could go down. So one of the thing, ch big challenges I see is women involvement. Um, like I said, we have our advisory boards, but we need more women to get involved. Um, but when we really do need men to be supportive as well. I know it, we were talking about women rights here, but like my husband supports me in everything I do. And he's there for me. Uh, he does he does the dishes if he has to. Um, he actually he does his own laundry. <laughs> uh, my kids, they're both boys and they do their own laundry. My oldest is responsible for the dishes. Um, everyone has their responsibilities in the household. It's not all just on me, the female. And I have that support system. But I feel that, if, especially if you're a single mom, it's harder. You don't have that support system there to be able to get more involved. Um, men have, they naturally already have a support system as soon as they're born. They, their, their mothers first look out for them, and then they get married, and their wives are, they expect their wives to look out for them. But for a woman, we're, we're thrown into life being the nurturer and the caretaker. And we're expected to do that job and not have it the other way around. So we really need men to be supportive to women as well and take on half of the responsibility. I mean, if we're expected to go to work and, you know, bring home the bacon and the paycheck, then the men need to be able to cook that bacon too when we bring it home. <laughs> so it needs to be a two-way street and it needs to be equal. And it's not, it, the world is different now. It's not just woman, woman roles in the household anymore. It should be equal and fair and go both ways. Well, I, I've been sitting here thinking because I mostly deal with telling stories from the past rather than thinking about these things. But I, and it, it occurred to me, I mean, at, at my stage of life, um, you know, I faced some of the problems that older people face, which is, 
you know, how are we going to live the last chapter with grace and engagement and uh, that sort of thing. And I do think one of the things that still is a, a frontier for women is uh, being, and it's much better than it used to be, but I think we're kidding ourselves if we think it's equal, and that's being paid, uh, paid a wage. And so some of us, a wage that's equivalent to what a man would make for the same work. And I think it just hit me that I think one of the things that affects us as older women is when we started, I was telling somebody today, I was looking back my first job, I got paid less than a school teacher did which was $5,000. I mean, that was a year. And you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a person of ripe years, but I'm still walking around and everything. So in, in my lifetime, so I think because a lot of women have not had earning power uh, throughout their life that it was really set up. I grew up in a world where my mom actually said, well, I didn't give you a middle name because when you get married, you'll have You'll have three names anyway, you know. So um, you were mentioning the, the options that were available. And the, the conventional wisdom when I was young was, well, you needed to go to college and learn a skill because something might happen to your husband, God forbid. So all that changed uh, a lot. And in, in many women, uh, because they wanted to or because they they needed to or whatever worked and did, did not... Uh, take the role that was sort of traditional when I was a young woman of working in the, working in the home. That was all changing um, when I started my first job. But I think it's true that uh, when one reaches, you know, into your, your later years, you realize that you're dealing with resources that were not, uh, that were what you were able to make in your life in terms of pay, but it's probably not what your work was worth. So I mean that's so I think that's something that to really uh, think about and continue and I'd support all the efforts to try to back um, you know the the ER one of the things I looked back on I said Florida did not uh, even um, endorse the 19th Amendment which gave women the right to vote until 1969 and they sort of did it as a token thing yet but the Equal Rights Amendment has never passed. You know, to, to, to basically state that there should be no discrimination on terms of sex. That's something that um, has never passed. So anyway, I guess I'm thinking just along those lines about uh, among the ceilings, let's not forget the, the economic. Yeah. My comments would um, start in the home uh, in the sense that um, not um, allowing your girls to fall into the stereotypic um, roles that are allocated to them almost um, almost as if it were natural. Um, studies say that um, that girls actually um, are academically as successful as boys uh, in elementary school and then all of a sudden, um, they become uh, less um, academically successful in science and math uh, because of really cultural uh, kinds of uh, norms. And I think as parents, um, we really need to, if you are a parent, you need to be aware of that so that you do not program your daughter and, your, and or your son uh, to play what we call stereotypic roles. Um, we have two, we had two boys and a girl, and our, um, my sons know how to take care of themselves, and the women who have married them have gotten, they have very good husbands. Uh, big, <laughs> they have very good husbands, husbands who know how to pitch in and um, be, uh, be helpful because um, you know that is um, that is how they were that is how they were brought up. Um, uh, once I was told uh, when we were we when we were fighting um, Orange County government um, um, commissioner uh, commissioner um, Donegan Bill Donegan called my home and my uh, my son answered the phone 
And uh, the commissioner said, it's funny, I, I, I would think of you as general in the theory, not, not mother in the theory, but the point is that, you know, that's uh, in the home we have that, that first opportunity. Uh, it is really unconscionable, however, that uh, women who are working at the same job are not, I, I mean, professional women are not making the same salary as their colleagues, and to me that just is, I, I will not take that. I will not uh, accept that because that's a holdover. That's a holdover from another era, but it seems to still be in place. And I do think that um, when it comes to economic uh, equality uh, in terms of women, that, that that is a fight that really needs to be seriously undertaken by data and by advocacy uh, because uh, the dollar is the same whether you are whatever your gender and you, if you are producing that quality of work, you need to be compensated uh, in that way. And it's quite, I, each time I read uh, in the New York Times of what's going on in Silicon Valley and or what's going in corporate America, I mean, that is, um, that really is an, an actionable item that needs to be taken seriously. Well, you know, I've given really deep thought on the question, and thank you. Uh, as a woman, we are always juggling, you know, between family and the pressures of community and our responsibilities as a job, responsibilities in, in family. Uh, we are, as, as a baby boomer, which I, I am very proud to say I am part of, uh, we are called the ham of the sandwich because we care for our children, care for our grandchildren. Then we have, on the other side, aging parents. Um, one of the concerns that I have, although I have a, a very supportive husband who is here with me today, and uh, loving children who have uh, helped me throughout the, my whole process, and my parents uh, to become you know, successful and be able to contribute uh, the way that you know my passion and, and my drive uh, uh, takes me. Uh, but one of the things that moving towards the future we must be very, very active and advocating is for our elderly. And uh, now that I've been caring for uh, my father, my aging father, who is his health is declining, I've seen the challenges that our older population are facing with some of the you know nursing facilities, rehab facilities, if um, you know I have taken a leave of absence and to care for them, and if I hadn't been there uh, advocating for him, he would not be with us today. We really have a serious, serious problem with the care of our aging population, and this is something that we all must uh, look into. You know. Uh, elected officials uh, take care of, look at, because it's very poor, you know, the, the, the services and the facilities that are taking care of our aging population. And I think uh, we, you know, need to step up and speak up and, and, and make sure, you know, I had one that I had to report to the state uh, the conditions, I was not only advocating for my father, I was advocating for those that didn't have anybody, that were there, that were crying, that were needing, that were dying. Uh, it is very unfortunate what we're living here. Uh, and I was surprised, because I thought, well, you know, Florida, uh, we have, you know, good hospitals, we have good, but, you know, for our aging population, that is not the reality. And I think we all need to make sure that we get involved, advocate, learn, and see what we can do to change and to improve the quality of care for our aging population, especially in Florida, which, you know, it's, it's, it's high. Uh, the population that is going into needing uh, health care, needing, you know, facilities. Uh, I've, I've opted to take my father back home and, and, and just take care of him there, you know. 
because what I've seen and the pain that I've gone through and what my father has had to face, and I see many in those facilities suffering and, and not a lot of people speaking up for them. So that would be my, my uh, goal and, and mission moving forward. Are there any other questions? On this side, any questions? I had a question, actually. Um, should I, we have one here? <laughs> OK. I, I, about the advisory boards, that was interesting when y you said there's, how do, how do people uh, apply to be on advisory boards or get information about that? So we have a board of appointees from the commissioners. So we each choose a person to put on this board that's called the MMRB, mm -hmm. and they, they go out, they try to recruit people to get onto these boards. And people could also apply on the website, in the Orange County website. And they take those applications and then they, they pick someone from those, that list of applications to appoint to these boards. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There's one out here. Please stand. Thank you. You said there's an MMRB. Mm -hmm. What's that? <laughs> It's a good question. I can never remember what it stands for. <laughs> but it's membership something, something, something. <laughs> yeah, I can never remember. We have acronyms like in the county and government. You can't remember what half of them stand mm -hmm. for. Any other questions? Oh, there's one. I was at the meeting today. I am in insurance and investments. And 40 years ago, I was the only Hispanic person with New York Life in Orlando. And today, there were 110 women and Hispanic people. So the, the power, the economics is growing so much. We really need representation, and we need to be more aware of what is happening in the community. And like, like you said, being involved, Emily, that's, that's so important. But we need more knowledge. We need more education about voting, about what our goals and what do we stand for, because many people don't understand the difference. Even within the parties, I had asked, what do you stand for? Or what is it? And people don't understand it. People just don't understand many of the areas, because we're raised in different societies, different mentalities. We need to educate more people. Thank you for all what you do. Briefly, it's Membership Mission Review Board. Membership Mission Review, Review Board. Board? Yes. Could you please stand? Thank you. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I don't like speaking publicly, so I apologize. But I do want to ask uh, this. You touched on um, growing up and uh, that internal dialogue that you were getting from your family and also you touched on how the stereotypes being taught from early and so there's family um, that give you these gender roles and things of that sort that are somewhat implanted. Um, I will say that um, me, I really never had that internal dialogue that I couldn't. Um, fortunate enough, my mother and my father uh, instilled in us uh, I didn't experience, I'll, I'll say, from, from people of importance, which were my mother and father, that I couldn't do anything. And um, with a technical background, I'm an engineer, uh, being an African American, being a mother, uh, also uh, working with, in leading programs, uh, programs in the United States Air Force. Um, that internal dialogue never was an issue uh, for me being in that male-dominated field. Um, so my question is, how though? Because even though that internal dialogue wasn't there for me, going into those different areas, there was still that external dialogue. Mm -hmm. But because of the internal dialogue that I had and, and the, the information that I knew, it was as if someone was telling me um, that uh, when others would say you couldn't do it, that voice in my head said, why? Um, what is it about me? I never took the, um, 
took the bait mm -hmm. and believed it. However, you still have to face those challenges at times. And even though the voice uh, or that, that external dialogue is not as loud as it used to be, um, it's still there, it's not silenced. So how is it that each of you who come from very unique, diverse backgrounds have dealt with that external dialogue? Well, I'll say that I don't know if I really had an internal dialogue because I really didn't have, yeah, because I don't know if I really had the structure I should have had growing up so no one told me I couldn't do anything because <laughs> no one was really watching over me anyway. So I felt like I could do really whatever I wanted. Um, but as I grew up, um, like the first time I experienced racism, for example, and discrimination, you know, as a minority, I, I dealt with that from a really young age. Um, and then hearing people tell me I can't do things. And I am, I just, my personality, um, I believe people are born with their personality, but then you also have, so it's not nature versus nurture, it's, mm -hmm. I believe it's a combination of both. And so I think I was just very stubborn. <laughs> so I would always question anyone anyway. You tell me I can't do something, I'm going to go and do it anyway. And just t by telling me I can't do something, it's going to push me even more to want to do it. So I've always, I guess, been a rebel. <laughs> but I've also, um, I've also fought for against bullies in school. Like I cannot see injustice either. That's just something innate in me too. I have to see justice and I'll fight for what's right. Um, and those are things that I've learned is just part of my personality that I feel I was born with and what makes me me. Um, and then the, the struggles that I went through through my life also made me who I am. So it gave me thicker skin, I believe. So that when people try to criticize me or you know tell me I can't do something, I'm always questioning right away. Um, like with the criticism, I'm like, okay, so now I'm questioning that because I'm very analytic as well. So if you're gonna say I'm doing something wrong or there's something wrong about me, what's your reasoning for that? And if they don't have a good reasoning, then I'll just ignore it. If they do have a good reasoning, then I'll look within myself and try to become a better person. So I do like criticism, but I wanna make sure it's the right criticism and they have reasoning behind it. So that's just me and what pushed me to where I am today. I would say that um, <clears throat> what your question um, brings to mind is the role of others uh, in terms of helping to build that capacity in an individual, particularly in a child. Uh, if you, uh, uh, traditionally, teachers um, had the, have had the capacity to complement or to support um, a child who may not come from a, a strong family background. Um, if you look at the structure and society, particularly in terms of the nonprofits, um, those who are involved in supporting children academically in terms of character building uh, really provide a kind of um, um, support that girds the society that girds the society. You know, we hear that it is cheaper to help a child as she or he is growing as opposed to incarcer paying for incarceration. Uh, you, you pay me now or you pay me later. And the advantage of, 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 that, um, of that support to children is very important. It's one of the it's one of the things, for example, in the Association to Preserve the Eaton Hill Community that we are very um, concerned with. Overall, we say that Preserve Eaton Hill Community is P E C, but P is also pride and heritage. E is educational excellence, and C is a cultural arts. Uh, now, notwithstanding. Uh, the people who have been uh, paying exorbitant fees to get their children into elite colleges, still, still education uh, is, is, is the way forward. Um, 
we, we were taught uh, in, in my generation, in my family, that no one can take from you your education. And when I was teaching uh, at the college level, I would tell students that there is no stupid question and you can be certain that there is always someone who is smarter than you and you can be certain that you are smarter than someone else. Uh, but the point is that you do the best that you can and it doesn't, take, it doesn't matter how long it takes you as long as you will strive. And the example of Zora Neale Hurston is really there. Uh, this, this woman uh, lied about her age so that she could go to night school for free in Baltimore. And she was 29 or 30 years old when she finally got her bachelor's degree. Um, but that, bis that education that uh, gives you your self-worth, uh, it, you um, it allows you to be a productive uh, human being. So to the extent that others, aside from family, if family is not there, that you can uh, get that support, that you can get that encouragement. And it really is a way that each of us has the ability to positively impact another person uh, by, by um, being a, how would you say, a, a good spirit or by, uh, by being able to help someone to find a resource that will help her or him along life's mission. I'd like to share with you, uh, that brought me, and it kind of touched me really deep, you know, and uh, with feelings, because when I was in sixth grade, I grew up in Chicago, inner city. Um, we walked from, in from uh, lunch, and on the board, the teacher had written all the names of students, and they, she had divided it. The majority were on this side, and only a little small group were on this side. And I looked, you know, like you do as a child, look for your name. And I was in that larger uh, uh, group. And so we asked, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, why is my name here? And, and she said, uh, it, was, it was very, you know, strong impact on me. But she said, all of these on this side the larger group, which the majority were children of color, mm -hmm. uh, will not even graduate high school. And this group, and there was, you know, there was a little boy that was, you know, I, I liked him a lot, his name, you know. He was, uh, they were all white. They said, and these will. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I talked to my uh, parents and I said, Dad, you know, you know they, they, they're telling me that I probably won't even graduate high school, you know, and he said, don't let anybody tell you what you could and cannot do. You know, you know that education, and he told me these words that you just said, which this is uh, uh, amazing. He said, education is what nobody can take away with the, from you. You will, that will be the key to success. He said, we're poor. I'm not going to be able to give you tons of money. And, but I will give you the toolbox that you will need to succeed. And don't let anybody tell you different. Believe in yourself, I believe in you. And, and he told my brother that. The other thing, he sat us down. We were, he was very active in the civil rights movement. And one time he took us to, I don't know if any of you are from Chicago, but he took us to Humble Park when all the riots were going on. Uh, because of discrimination against, you know, uh, minorities. And he said, you know, in the news, they're talking about all these people that are troublemakers that were the Black Panther and the, the Young Lords and Latin Kings. And he said, those are fighting for your rights. Those are fighting to, to defend you so you could have an opportunity. And, that, and don't, feel, don't ever feel that you're less because you're Puerto Rican. You're proud. We have a beautiful culture. We have beautiful language. And he taught us how to be strong in that aspect, in that environment. And along the line, along the, the way, I also had phenomenal teachers, which, you know, believed in me and, and told me, you could do it. You're smart. You're intelligent. You're beautiful. And... You know, that, those tools, it's true. We must, 
We all should take the responsibility to make sure we talk to young people, to children, about how beautiful they are, what they can do, that they could accomplish things if they work hard, you know, and give them that, that confidence because we all have it. But if we do not get those, you know, along the way, that support, uh, we will end up, you know, probably on the wrong side of, of history. So, you know, that, when you ask that question, it just kind of brought that, that moment of when, when I saw my name in that side, and, you know, I said, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to graduate, and I am the first generation in my family to, to graduate college with a bachelor's, master's, and my brother's an attorney. So I did want to mention that um, I am starting a mentorship program for girls in high schools. So if anyone's interested in being a mentor, you can reach out to my office. We're also looking for donations as well because we need to, we need to find corporate sponsors is what they call it for paying the teachers for their time afterwards and also we would like to do a field trip with them which we'll need some funds for as well. So again, you could reach out to my office and it's to inspire girls to go to college and that they could do jobs which are mostly male dominated. So I think we have another question over here. Good evening. My name is uh, Aide de Leon Arroyo. I come from Puerto Rico. As a former police officer in the U.S. Army, I can take that, you know, woman power. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it is to be in a field of men power. So now I'm a special need paraprofessional of CPS. Once already, girls, to go over there and jump and help you. The question is, is I'm very interested and woman like me interested to join you. So where to go, um, where to go, um, who to ask to join your excellent group. And uh, once again, thank you to do this, to eye opening to us. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, Jeanette there, she could give you her card. And if you could connect, then we can give you some opportunities where you can get more involved. Thank you. I would like to have you hear Zora Neale Hurston's voice in a folk tale. It will just take a, a minute because I think that um, it gives you a sense of who she actually was as a writer. Uh, and this is in dialect. The wind is a woman and the water is a woman too. They used to talk together a whole heap. Mrs. Wind used to go sit down by the ocean and talk and, pache, and patch and crochet. They was just like all lady people. They love to talk about their children and brag on them. Mrs. Water used to say, look at my children. I got the biggest and the littlest in the world, all kinds of children, every color in the world and every shape. The wind lady bragged louder than the water woman. Oh, but I got more different children than anybody in the world. They flies, they walks, they swims, they sings, they talks, they cries. They got all the colors from the sun. Lord, my children show is a pleasure. Tain't nobody got no babies like mine. Mrs. Water got tired of hearing about Mrs. Wind children, so she got so she hated him. One day, a whole passel of her children come to Mrs. Wind and says, Mama, we thirsty. Can we go get us a cool drink of water? She says, Yeah, children, run on over to Mrs. Water and hurry right back soon. When them children went to quench their thirst, Mrs. Water grabbed them and drowned them. When her children didn't come home, the wind, water got, the wind woman got worried, so she went on down to the water and asked for her babies. Good evening, Miss Water. You see my children today? The water woman told her, no. Mrs. Wynn knew her children had come down to Mrs. Water's house, so she passed over the ocean calling her children, and every time she called, the white feathers would come up on top of the water. And that's how come we got white caps on the waves. It's the feathers coming up when the wind woman calls her lost babies. When you see a storm on the water, it's the wind and the water fighting over them children. Thank you all for joining us today. As women, we are faced with obstacles every day, and our job is to be strong against all odds. I'm so proud of how far we've come, and I have no doubt that we will continue to prosper. 
American civil rights activist, memoirist, poet and singer Maya Angelou once wrote, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lines. You may trod me in the very dirt, but, but still, like dust, I'll rise. We are the future and we will continue to rise. Thank you for being here with me today. You women are just amazing and inspirational to me. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And thank you for everyone, to everyone for coming. It's been a great event. Thank you so much for being part of it. Thank you.